So here we go. So my name is Core, and uh, I have a lot of international people listening in. So the spelling is the Scandinavian version, but it's the same as Core. I prefer maybe Core the Universe. I used to say Core an Apple. That was no good because I was called Apple for a couple of months. I'm a physical therapist and uh, an osteopath, Dio, and I've started the Brown Institute classes in 2008. And now I'm also a visual manipulation lecturer. And I have, uh, the, I'm the director of the Brown Institute in Denmark. So I organize the classes here. I'm also a course addict. So I uh, run around and do classes. I've done that over for a number of years. Um, so nowadays it's uh, with many different hats on. I'm the organizer and I'm sometimes the lecturer and uh, sometimes the TA and sometimes just the participant. So I'm traveling around and I'm meeting people, therapists globally, and that is my teacher. I try to find different levels of understanding and progressing in my understanding also by being a lecturer. So, yeah. So we're talking about visual manipulation. That is gently specific placed manual forces to encourage mobility, tone, and inherent tissue motion. But we're mainly focusing on the connective tissue around the organs or around any other structure in the body. So we're also working with the structural integrity of the entire body or effects to the entire body. Gail Wessler is the curriculum responsible of the Brown Institute. She has this term of organ specific fascial mobilization. I kind of like that one because uh, uh, I used to say that I was manipulating organs and that did not go down well with a general practitioner that I was referring to or talking to at the, back in the day when I was studying osteopathy. So this may be a better term. It's better to talk about the biomechanics and the structures around the organs or the nerve supply, vascular supply, rather than it is saying that you're mobilizing a kidney, for instance. So why do we do visceral manipulation? We say that about 90% of musculoskeletal dysfunction involve visceral, not necessarily caused by, but there's a lot of involvement of the visceral to the musculoskeletal situation. All the organs are surrounded by connective tissue. So if there's an adverse connective tissue tension that can give a restriction of the organ and impair the healthy motion of an organ and its associated structures. Medically, we know that there is a referred pain patterns from each of the organs. We're trying also to feel what happens mechanically around the organs itself. So, so let's see. The curriculum of visceral manipulation within the Brown Institute is uh, quite extensive. Started out with a core pack of VM1 through 6. Where in VM1, we talk about the abdomen. VM2, we go a little bit deeper to some of the deeper organs within the abdomen. Three is more inside the pelvis, but also the frame of the pelvis. So the sacrum and the iliac and the pubic bone. So there's a relationship of the frame, the heart frame, as well as the soft, the softer uh, organs inside. And they, connected tissue around them. Same for the thorax. We'll talk about the heart frame, 
the spine and the ribs, but also of the connective tissue around the lungs and uh, heart inside. Five, we go into the manual thermal diagnosis and start talking a little bit about connections to the emotions. We continue on in six with the visceral emotional relationships. We have the BM6 coming in Copenhagen in August. If we are so lucky that we can actually have classes again. So it's, it's extensive, specific anatomy of the abdomen, the pelvis, and the thorax. And it's organ-specific biomechanics. And we are working a lot with our hands to palpate and to test a specific treatment of attachment of the organs in the fascia. And then there's also an evaluation skill that we are learning. It's called listening. I'll explain a little bit more later on what that is. So it's a whole treatment approach, but more so compared to other osteopathic classes, I think we take a lot of time to develop our manual skills within the Brown Institute. The Brown Institute is named uh, from Jean-Pierre Perrault. We have an image up here. Uh, he is a physical therapist, but also an osteopath, DO. For more than 40 years, he's been working as a DO. And he says he's the developer of the visual manipulation, but not the creator. He tends to say that he stands on the shoulders of others. So he has not forgotten the osteopathic history and uh, has learned from a lot of people and is now explaining and describing and also developing a lot of new techniques and ideas. He started out uh, in the lung disease hospital in Grenoble and he had a great chance to work a lot with dissection. Uh, and that gave him an opportunity to um, uh, treat patients first and then after they passed, he had a chance to also uh, evaluate their tissues as he dissected them. So that's a great opportunity he had to, to be able to see the dysfunctions that he actually had felt before were they seen in, in the body after. So that gave him some good insights. He was puzzled by a situation with a, uh, a patient that he was treating in the low back and um, they had gone to a full healer in the Alps um, to have help through the abdomen and actually it was helped. So he was wondering what that situation was. So he was going to the folk, folk healer and he also started uh, investigating what was going on in the abdomen to see how that would affect the lumbar spine and further on into the thorax and pelvis and so on. He's, since then, he's been constantly exploring and studying and developing. And he's been a big part of developing visceral manipulation neural manipulation, a new manual achigaro approach, vascular clashes, and he continues on to develop classes. At the moment, he is uh, working on the brain. Probably, he says, that could be his last, but let's see. Let's see. He's also on to some uh, ideas about trauma, and he said that one trauma class he had here in Copenhagen, that, that's going to go into an advanced trauma curriculum and maybe he's talking about the trauma too. So let's see what happens. He did try to retire from his uh, clinic in Grenoble and move to Camarck. He bought a farm down there with olives and uh, horses and everything, but people found him. So he had to now start up a new clinic at 72, now he's 75. And um, he continues on. It's an amazing energy and an amazing uh, explorative life that he has. So we're happy to cling on to his um, enthusiasm. I, for me, is definitely, definitely a, a, a guy to look up to, to uh, try to develop myself in the same way. So uh, it reminds me a little bit of our, the founding father, Andrew Taylor Still of osteopathy. Uh, 
he uh, has this phrase that uh, osteopath stays home to study anatomy while other people would go and play billiard. Yeah, it said that uh, anatomy and anatomy and anatomy. And it's the same thing that I hear Jean-Pierre saying on his way to one of his classes that I was hosting for him in Copenhagen, a colleague of mine saw him sitting there uh, looking at his iPad, anatomy again. And I went to the local medical school where he just had to buy the little tiny book of anatomy he hadn't seen before. Every day he's studying a little bit of anatomy. And that's a great example for everybody else. Some of his quotes, only the tissue know. And listening is anatomy based. So you have to know your anatomy to understand what it is that you feel in the body. You have to know your way around. If you don't know the streets of the city, you may get lost. But you also want the body to speak to you. You want to feel what the body can tell you. Rather than the hearing the story from the patient, he's much more interested in feeling what's going on in the body. So he's saying that the body hugs the lesion. Sometimes that is very, very visible. So if you have a liver problem, you may turn over towards that side, rotate right and side bend towards that midsection where the liver is at. Or if you can't see it, they're actually straight up, you may feel that attraction to that liver. So he's always saying, where is it that the patient want our help and attention? He said, it's not our choice, but we have to feel our way to where we need to work. So I started out with the musculoskeletal stuff. And I was working with the muscles and the joints and the ligaments. But I didn't think much of what was inside the container, right? So the rooms that were inside the body, I didn't think much of. I was thinking about the frame outside. And it took me a while to fill out those spaces. They were kind of blank, dark spaces for me. Um, and if you're coming as a physio or a manual therapist, it may be the same for you. So we have to try to fill in all the organs that are in there and see how they relate to the musculoskeletal system. So we have cross section. The surrounding abdominal wall we know about and the spine and the paraspinals, maybe the psoas, but do we know that the kidney is laying up against the psoas and the liver is laying up against the kidney and the intestines are laying in front? So that was like a black box for me that was revealed when I started studying osteopathy and later on was practicing more with the, the bronze to the details and the specificity. Visual structures are affected by many things. We know the uh, central nervous system gives us voluntary motions. So whenever we move, we're also moving the content of the container that I just spoke of. The autonomic nervous system innovates all of the organs. So they would also, of course, have an effect and refer back to the spine or the neck somewhere through the sympathetic and parasympathetic system. The cranial sacral system we know of may have an effect also, and the lymphatic system. So these four are all extrinsic factors that will have an effect to the movement of the viscera. But there's also an intrinsic motility, the movement of the organ itself. So the autonomic nervous system has an important feedback role to the body or from the body to the head. So all the hollow organs have smooth cells. 
the diaphragmatic motion also runs every day and the cardiovascular has a pulsation of 120,000 per day. It's a lot. And that is controlled by the autonomic nervous system. The peristaltic system as well is controlled by the autonomic nervous system. So we have a supporting system with a double layered and fluid system that supports uh, the cohesion of the abdominal area. And there's some two perfect. Let's go through them one by one to see what that is. So the support system, uh, the double layer system, it's two serious membranes wrapped around each of the organs. So I have to find some new images today to show you a little bit. So if we have the liver here, you have a visceral peritoneum and a parietal peritoneum around that liver. Each of the organs will have both a visceral layer and a parietal layer. So if we take it the picture below, we can see from the back wall you will have the peritoneum, the mesentery, coming out. So it's surrounding each of the organs, in this case, a piece of the small intestines. There is fluid between these layers, both between the visceral peritoneum and the parietal peritoneum, but also between the two parietal peritoneums, between two organs. There needs to be a gliding possibility between. Otherwise, it can be sticky, which could be because of an infection that then it adheres to each other. So it's like a joint surface between two organs are not moving as it's supposed to. And that would affect the abdomen as well as the adjacent uh, muscles or the feedback mechanism through the nervous system to the spine. The Tugor effect is how it is situated in the system and how that is kept in position by everything else around it. One of the examples I, I think of is the one dissection that I went to where on normally a dissection, when we look at the abdomen, it is opened up. Everything is taken off when you can see all the organs inside here. So it's like you have a ball full of organs that's laying inside. And there's right there in situ, they're in their right position. But this one time, we actually started the dissection from behind and took the muscles off and opened up there before we looked at the abdomen. And as soon as we turned this body around, all the organs just floated down or melted down alongside the spine. So the ball wasn't there anymore. The Tuker effect wasn't there anymore. We have some pressure system or intracavital pressures that are a little different depending on where you are in the body. In the thorax, we have negative pressure. So the air can be taken inside. Enhanced by the diaphragm, obviously, when it's pulled down, we have more negative pressure to pull the air in. Underneath the diaphragm, we have positive pressure. And the further away from the diaphragm you go, the more positive it is. So everything would try to go towards negative, right? So things just underneath the diaphragm would try to seek up towards the thorax. But if it comes too positive, it would have a tendency to go down rather than to be pulled up. So this is a significant matter of how the organs are kept in place also. So the peritoneum, that's a little bit like a balloon. We talked 
shortly about that to understand what that is in VM1. But in VM2, we take more time in palpating and using uh, manual feeling around the balloon so we can treat it as well. This becomes very pertinent if you have uh, scar tissue for operations or if you have hernias or if you have some kind of restriction within the abdomen, it can also affect the surrounding balloon. It is a continuous membrane all the way around and from the back wall, from the posterior parietal peritoneum, there is mesentery coming out to the front, encasing the organs. So there is the parietal and the visceral peritoneum, and there is the cavity that holds the serious fluid. So here's a couple of images of that. On this side, we have the answer of you, meaning that you're looking in from the front to the back. So the blue here is posterior parietal peritoneum, the blue. And these are openings to it where the mesentery comes out. So this is the mesentery root, and this is the mesocolon, the ascending colon, for instance. And in the other picture over here, we see it a posterior view. So we're looking from the back to the front. And let me just move this around. Okay. So we have on this side, on the right side, we have peritoneum. On the left side, it's in front of the peritoneum. So that's the transversitis fascia. Right. We can see here within the peritoneum the teres ligament that comes from the falciform ligament of the liver and comes down to the umbilicus. This is within the peritoneum. And the three pre-vesicle ligaments coming down and around the bladder. So already here, we can talk about a connection through the peritoneum from the liver to the bladder. Here's another image without all the organs, how the peritoneum is inside from the diaphragm and all the way down. Imagine now this image over here that is like this all the way around on the other side or the lateral side and in the back. So this is the balloon area. As a PT, you would think about the muscular balloon maybe that uh, surrounds the peritoneum and you think about how you can stabilize with your training this balloon, but that also has an effect on the peritoneum and the other way around. If there's a problem with the peritoneum, it will disturb that stability musculature. So here's an image again of that's a cross section of the peritoneum. So we have the back wall here, the liver up here. And from that back wall, we have this, the lesser momentum coming out to the transverse colon. And we have the greater momentum hanging down from the stomach as well as the transverse colon. And here's a example of the uh, mesentery coming to the small intestines. So we learn how to find these different parts of the peritoneum and to treat them as well, eventually. So it comes up and around the liver as well, and creates then the glisson capsule and up to the um, coronary ligament around the liver itself. So our purpose here is to work with the interface of the biomechanics and the physiology. We want to stretch and release visceral ligaments because they are rich in nerve supply and they do affect proprioceptive communication. We talk about that as well with ligaments or um, tendons within the musculoskeletal system. And the more they are rich in supply, the more feedback mechanism they can give. So we want 
the visual to move with greater ease so that we physically entirety of the body can move with greater ease but also so the organs can function better and adapt to their environment so mobility for organs are then an expression of health because if they do not move well it can give irritation visceral spasm that will then affect digestion absorption elimination vascular and lymphatic, uh, lymphatic function so now if i can persuade all of you i cannot see what you do but please do nonetheless sit back a little bit and put your hands upon your abdomen better that you put it underneath your shirt and just to feel underneath your shirt into your abdomen and now visualize as you softly keep your hands on your abdomen the different layers that you can imagine that goes through here. Let me go through some of them for you. At the very outer superficial layer is the skin. You can move the skin around a little bit on top of everything. And underneath there, there's a fascia on top of the musculature. But before you get there, there's even a little bit of fatty tissue. So the superficial fat. And underneath that, again, then you have the deep fascia layer before you get to the muscle. And once you get onto the muscles, they are more bossy and warm, and they actually do have directions. So you will be able to feel the rectus abdominis that has a vertical lines, or yeah, you're a little bit deeper, some oblique lines for the external and internal obliques and even a bit deeper, the transverse muscular lines for the transverse abdominal musculature. And then if you come underneath the musculature, so if you're in doubt, you can keep one hand and push a little bit with your, onto your head, and you should be able to feel the muscle contract. So you know the level of the muscle. Then feel underneath the muscles to feel that balloon. Now you can start to feel the cohesiveness of the balloon all the way around as you feel that. As you come underneath and inside the balloon, there is a bit of an apron, so to speak, that lays down from that stomach and transverse colon. This is the great momentum. That is a, an insulator. But it's also like the policeman that uh, goes to where there is a problem in the abdomen. It protects and has what the immune function to do. Come a little bit deeper than that, you land onto the tubes of the small intestines. Try to see if you can feel the buzziness of the tubes as you feel through. Don't push through, just feel. So the visualization that you do is what gets you there. And go even deeper to feel through to the back wall, all the way to the back where the root of the mesentery is. And now slowly visualize your way back to the tubes from there to the great momentum, from the great momentum to the peritoneum and to the bossy muscles and all the way out to the superficial fat and into the skin again. So for me, that was a bit funky to talk about this one because normally I can see that you do it when I'm in class. No response in this situation. Let's talk a little bit about terminology. So restriction is any loss of motion. So we know that from musculoskeletal, if there is a lack of mobility of your elbow, it doesn't go all the way in, or the rotation doesn't go, right? But it's the same thing with the visceral restriction when an organ loses its ability to move. We are interested in being in touch 
with that um, restriction of the viscera, or for that matter, for this terminology, for any other part of the body, to feel that restriction. And when that person's body release, so we can communicate with the nervous system and give feet to the head, just waking up a little something, Jean-Pierre would always say. So know your anatomy. If you want to study visceral manipulation, start studying what's inside the abdomen. Look at the topography. Look at each of your organs' position, form, size, density. Look where they're located. Look what they are relating to. That gives you a much better chance to be precise and specific when you start palpating them. Once you're in the abdomen, we talk about viscosity, liquid osteopathy. Because the body, and especially around the abdomen, there's so big a percentage that is water. We also want to work with three dimensions. So a lot of the techniques are with three vectors also. And we're listening to the tissue of the body instead of trying to push on to the patient. So we're trying to give a diagnosis concept of general listening, local listening, mobility and motility, and using the use of inhibition. I will try to explain that a little bit. But first of all, I have a point to make with the visualization. Again, knowing your anatomy gives you a much better chance of visualizing. So knowing what's normal for you to be able to feel with your manual experience and putting that together with your visualization gives an enormous advantage of you for you when you're starting to palpate. That goes the same for the musculoskeletal work or the craniosacral for that matter. So the visualization is enormously important to know and know what you have inside the body to be able to listen in and feel what's going on. But knowing all this structure, you also have to let go a little bit when you listen. So you're not already thinking, I know what it is. First, you have to listen in and feel what kind of density, what kind of feeling is it? What's the lines, what the, what's the form, how, what's the depth? So you, you feel first, and then you think about what it is later. You go back to your library of knowledge as you've been listening, visualizing what form it is, and then you can think about, ah, so that must be the liver, or that much must be the ascending colon, because this is where I am. So there are some causes of restriction or visceral spasm. You could have an infection, whether it's bacterial, viral, or parasitic, or you could have repetitive stress or emotion that it's also for the musculoskeletal as well as it is for the visceral situation can have a negative effect on those structures. So postural stress obviously also will diminish or change the room or the cavities and this diminish then the possibility for motion. So if you think about the thorax now for a little bit, and you're thinking about the room or the cavity for the heart. And imagine somebody that has a very strong kyphosis that gives very little room for the heart to move and to pump or for the lungs to expand. If you have that kyphosis locking in, it's difficult to fully expand when you breathe in. 
so your breathing becomes less and the connective tissue around the heart and the lungs becomes more tight and diminishes also the ability for these structures to move. Physical trauma, that goes to where the heart places are. Not always physiological, it can go through the system in a non-physiological way. So if it hits your side, it may go not necessarily along the rib, but in the rib, inside one of the lobes of the um, uh, lung or connected tissue around the lung, into the heart, along the heart, and over to the other side, and then land over here somewhere. So you may be hit on one side, but have an effect to the other. Surgery, we talked a little bit about the stickiness of surgery, that if that can dry out that um, fluid that we have between the organs. If you get a chance to look at the laparoscopy operation, it is very nice to see how the fluid and this gliding surface are evident. But if they open up, you can get that stickiness but also just from scar to scar tissue creating. Then of course, we also have all this, the uh, chemical stresses of diet and smoking and drinking. And the emotional part, we will talk about that a lot more in the later classes, how emotions and stress can affect into the visceral. Changes during age, but also again with the neural Phrenic activity will have more tension, especially in the upper part of the abdomen where the phrenic innervates the connective tissue. We do have some contraindications to treat viscerally, um, but these are similar contraindications to some of the musculoskeletal situations, right? There's, if there's an inflammatory process or fever or itis, you don't really want to work directly on that situation. The abdominal aneurysm is always asked about at classes. So we're, um, it's difficult for us to feel as beginners, but with practice, we can actually feel one. I have not come across one myself, but I have heard about the, uh, the volume of it. Uh, that is different and how it feels different than the normal big pump, pumping feeling of the aorta. So these are all recognizable things that we would do really not want to touch. And if you're in any kind of doubt, you should send off to the MD, especially if there is severe pain without any other explanation, or if your hands get pushed off the body. This is what we call peritoneal push-off as well. And also we know about the swollen lymph nodes, um, if we have them several places, not just one lymph node, because like you know, lymph is like the garbage system. And if one is swollen, it can be because that local area is having some trouble getting rid of the garbage there. Let's say you have a crank in your neck because you're uh, looking at a beautiful lady over there and it gets stuck. So you have a mechanical block of your neck. Then one or two lymph nodes in the neck around the uh, SCM, the sternocleidal mastoid, will probably be working overtime and then increase in size because there's a local problem there. So you have to feel a little further than just that one lymph node, all the way down into the armpits, into the groin, etc., to see if there's a general reaction rather than just one or two. So there's something called precautions as well. This means that we have to take care, but we can still very often treat. 
So there's something that are maybe local or something that is depending on a specific system. So the diabetes, yes, you have to be a little more careful in how you work. Choose your techniques wisely. Don't go too hard when you know the vascularization may be not so good. Same goes for cortisol. The tissue may be a little uh, fragile. Also for radiation and chemotherapy, right? Then you also have to think a little bit about how much can this patient actually handle because they may not have the immune system to handle a good dose of manual therapy. So there are several things here that you can see that they are precautions that are necessarily a contraindication. The IUD, that's an intrauterine device. So that's in the uterus that it does not stop us from working with the liver or the lungs, right? But locally around the uterus, you have to take much more care. As a beginner, it's a no-go, but as an experienced practitioner, knowing the soft, subtle feel, being very soft, you can actually test here as well. With good mind of the softness in your hands, you're able to do it. But if you're in doubt, just don't. Step back from yourself and then do maybe something else to see what happens. It's always good to send it off to the MD if you are in doubt and want an extra check. Yes, they are busy. And most of the time, yeah, 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 that's nothing. But it gives you a good rapport with the general practitioner if you actually have something that is uh, uh, caught, something that are, are maybe a, um, a red flag or a yellow flag. So don't do it too much, but be conscious to send off if there is a red flag. Motility and sphincter work has no contraindication. There's something you can always do if the patient allows it. So if the patient says yes, and if the body says yes, sometimes the mind of the patient says, oh yes, I want some treatment. Yes, give me more. But the body says no. And then it's time for you to step back. It takes a little experience as a practitioner to know when that is. But it's something that is very worth practicing to feel when is it enough? When is it time for the body to work its own rather than me putting more energy into it? I spent the last few years talking or practicing that a lot to really feel when does the listening say, when does the body say, now it's enough. So here's an, another nice little exercise for you. First, we look at the position of the liver here on my right side. So it's on the right side of the body underneath the diaphragm. We go through the position and and the relationship in depth in the VM1. But it lays underneath the lower part of the rib cage on the right side. It comes to the mid clavicular line on the left side. So we have a good contact possibility over here on the lateral side. So here's an enlargement on that lateral side. We see liver tissue here. We see lung tissue here. And we see the visceral and the um, parietal pleura coming down. So this is the uh, custard diaphragmatic space here. So there's a connective tissue space that goes all the way down here. And then there's the diaphragm. And then on the other side, you see the connective tissue of the liver coming up here, right? So that would be the coronary ligament coming up this way, and then the liver. Whoops, sorry. So if you start from outside, we have the skin, the superficial fat, some muscle layer, 
and then the ribs where you do have muscles between. And then you come to the pleura or the diaphragmatic space, the diaphragm, and then into the liver. So let's try to do that, everybody. I cannot see you, but I expect that everybody will now put their right hand on to the side here, the right hand and then the left on top. So softly feel underneath your shirt, perhaps, onto the skin and slowly sink in slightly deeper from the skin into the subcutaneous fascia. You can move that around, right? You can move it around on top of the ribs. Feel some of the muscular tissue underneath there before you land on a bony feel. So you can start to feel the ribs that are running around. If you have your fingers in this way, you can follow the ribs along, right? And you can dip your fingers in between each of the ribs to feel the muscular tissue. And then you take a little more depth, not pushing in, but relaxing and letting go of the bone, taking time to sink a little deeper. And then you feel underneath there a connective tissue sheath. And to be sure you on that, why don't you bring in the other hand a little higher up? So once you push softly here, you should be able to feel the sheath going all the way down to the other hand. So as you lay your hand here, you should be able to connect the two together. After that, sink a little deeper until you hit something moving now. You can feel the breath. If you really feel the breathing as you're here, that's the diaphragm. Even deeper, there is a solid mass. So to be on the liver, you have to feel the solid mass. If you bring the other hand in over here, you can put them together around the solid mass. So it takes some visualization to come onto the liver and slowly, slowly sink into the right level of the liver. So, but how to find where to start? So the diagnosis part of it, the evaluation skill that I talked about, listening. We use a general listening to start. Always, every patient. I still take my anamnesis, but that's because I realize I have a bad memory because I have to write stuff down and I put that in the computer and then I do this. I take a clean slate. And I try to forget everything that they just told me because I just want to write that down. And then I can go on to the real business. I want to feel what's in that body. So a general listening gives an impression of the entire system. So we have a general listening. And when we do that, we want to be attentive. We don't want to push ourselves onto them. We want to be engaged in tissue and feeling and waiting for a reaction. We don't want to push on, go into the barrier, just to feel. Waiting for the tissue response and letting the body speak to us. So there's a big difference between attention. We do take a little compression in and then feel what level would the body then give us something to feel. Where does it take us? Where does it want our attention? On the other hand, we can use intention for some techniques. So we can go into the barrier. That's more of an active situation. Most manual therapists are used to that, rather than whether it's a direct or an indirect technique, but that's therapist force that we're using. And that's very goal-oriented. 
So most of the techniques we do, we start with an intention to set something up, but then we switch and feel for the patient tissue response. And that's particularly important when you do listening. So be aware of what the body can tell you. So listening will tell you the most important lesion right now. Not necessarily the key lesion or the primary problem of this patient in their life, but what's the most important right now on the greatest influence on the body. But that means it can also change instantly. Once you have addressed that particular issue, it may go somewhere else. And you may have to treat then an entirely different part of the body to have a effect on the entirety of the system. So we are zooming into specific, working with that area, coming out, zooming out again, and evaluating one more time before we zoom back in again. Zoom in and zoom out. For the general listening, try not to put our own belief onto the patient's body. So we're trying to feel we're being pulled to. It could be for some people like a laser beam or it could be a drawing or a light. Or For me, it's more of a pull. So it's a different explanation for what it is that you feel. The first motion is usually the one that is the correct one. If you tend to stay for a long time, you may lose your sense and I suggest that you start over and try to work with the compression decompression to get to the level where the body will speak to you especially as a beginner take your time with finding the level where the body talks rather than say oh I'm here now you can do that when you've practiced a lot so for our general listening, that's the start, and it tells us where in the body. Only a region, so it's right or left, from the back, or how far down or up in the system is it? You're not trying to be specific on the hepatic artery or the metacarpal, whatever, right? Just say a region. Is it in the abdomen, in the front, or you know, on the right side, or is it in the low back, or is it in the head? And then you go on to the local listening, right? The local listening. For this image here, and for the VM1, it's the abdominal local listening that we talk about. And within that region, we're trying to be a little more precise. And then we try to feel for which side of the abdomen, and what's the depth, and what's the form and maybe also the consistency of the tissue that you're feeling. You're not pushing in, but you're feeling, you're visualizing. So that's practice for your fingers and your hands. So make the standard if you try to do the general listening at home, if you had not done so. Once you get to class and you uh, get this repeated, you will have supervision how to do so and have somebody else that has uh, practiced this for a while to uh, help you feel the level that you need to be on. But you will use your dominant hand on top of the head, on the vertex. So top of the head, try to see if you can make a cross up there in the center, and that's where you would put your hand. Do it the same way every time to start and stand in the same position. Keep your space, slight distance, be relaxed, be in balance yourself. So you can have the option to put the other hand. I, I still do that. A lot of the lectures only do that one hand. But for me, it's a way to keep my personal space or the patients. So keep the feet slightly apart. I would say in hip width. So somebody with big, uh, broad hips, you may have broad stance, 
somebody with smaller hips, you have smaller stance. And take away stuff that will have a possibility to pull in the system in some way. Belts and buckles and watches and, and hairbands. I hate hairbands. Take them out. <laughs> yeah. So if the listening now goes down, 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 down the body to one side, you may be in doubt whether it's something in this area, the spine or the abdomen, but it could also be in the leg. So if you sit the person down and do the listening again and it changes, then you've taken away the leg, right? And then that must be the leg that is the reason. If it's still the same, it's still in the body because you can still feel the body. But that, takes you time to practice and work with. So in the lab, we're just interested in, is it a region? What region are we looking for? I already said this one, I think. Okay, so locally, we're trying to find within the abdomen or whatever local area we are evaluating, is there a couple of issues here that we can find or which one is the more dominant within that region? So we find with the general region and with the local, we're trying to specify even more. Is there one or two issues that are important? And can we differentiate which is the most important? For this, we often use inhibition. So as you see this image here, uh, try to see if I can move this. Yep. So if we have a listening hand in the center, and then you have an inhibiting hand here. So if you feel an attraction going over to this area, I think they said the gallbladder, I think the gallbladder will probably be over here. So the image is not quite correct, but let's say that you felt an attraction going here with your listening hand. And now you take your other hand and put it softly here. It's enough to erase that line that you feel with your listening hand to take away the feeling of listening going over there. If this is the important one. So inhibition is a very good tool for us to decide which is the more important right now in the local area. Another point is to meet the patient because we're now trying to sell to you to find the most important point in the body is not necessarily where they have their symptoms, but does it relate to their symptoms? Sometimes it actually does and it gains a lot of confidence with the patient if you can then do a test retest situation and uh, relate the thing that you found with your general local listening, mobility test, and such and cetera, to where they have their issue. That also explains cause and effect that we're interested in rather than just working with the symptoms, we're interested in working with the cause of the symptoms. So let's take an example of the shoulder pain, right? If you have pain in the shoulder, it could be from the liver. That would then give a general listening answer to the right and to the midsection of the body. Local listening of the abdomen would take you to the liver. And if you then inhibit the liver, it improves the um, rotation of the shoulder. And in, that would be then underneath the diaphragm, so it would be more like internal rotation, right? So. But it does change, or even just pushing the shoulder posteriorly as you inhibit the liver will also feel different if it is the liver that causes the shoulder issue. Because it could also be a rib or the costodiaphragmatic space or the, the bronchi or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Could be a lot of things. You have to find the primary problem to test with to make that big of a difference for them to see. Another example for you is they have ischial pain. The test for 
the ischial nerve would be the SLR or the straight leg raise. And if there's a really big problem with the uh, ischial pain, you could have maybe only 30 or 40 degrees of lift in the straight leg raise. So that's laying on your back and lifting the entirety passively, listening, lifting the entirety of the leg up to feel the resistance. It could be you or it could be the patient and both of you feeling this resistance. And then let's say the uterus were, was responsible and you have found with your general listening low in the abdomen with your local listening into the pelvis and with the local mobility and, and differential listening found the uterus and you inhibit the uterus and all of a sudden you can move that leg 30 degrees more up towards 70 degrees. That proves to the patient that you are um, finding something that has an effect to their symptomatic area. And that gives you then time to work with what you found with your own pace and then come back and test again to see is there a change for them. So once you're locally, we test for the organs in three different ways. We test mobility. So does the organ itself move with the surrounding structures? We also test motility over here. That's the inherent motion of the organ. So what the organ itself does independently of its surrounding structures. And then we test differential listening. So now we have general listening, we have local listening, but we also have differential listening. So I said before that general listening takes us to a region. The region could be the abdomen. Within the abdomen, we may find, let's say, the cecum, the start of the large intestines. So on the cecum itself, we are now testing differential listening. So let's have a look. Mobility is the key to life. Movement is the key to life, all our Grimsby said. So where things are positioned, it's not so important as if it moves. You can be very, very uh, disbalanced or have a large scoliosis or have a massively valgus knee, but if you're able to move it, it's okay. Today, actually, I had my patient that has this valgus knee. It is getting less and less, but he's been coming uh, every third month for a while now, uh, but he's still slightly in valgus. But he's running 70 kilometers a week. He is 60 years old, and he had this very, very, you know, valgus like knee, and for the longest time, is very, very much in valgus. But he kept going, he kept moving it. So the position is not the most important, but the movement is. So an organ in good health obviously moves in all planes and has good physiological motion. And it is moved by external forces. A lot of the time, by the musculoskeletal system or the diaphragm mover and things. So we're moving in three different planes and it rotates around its own axis in mobility, but it also does in motility actually. So at least one of these planes may be restricted in mobility. So here's an example for the cecum how we do uh, move the cecum, right? So we're coming around the cecum. So this image down here is the abdomen. We have the upper end here and the lower here. So we're on the right side of the abdomen with these two hands. And the cecum, the start of the uh, colon is here. The small intestines is here. So this is where the, 
this latch intestine starts a colon and goes up and around and down on the other side. So we're enveloping, coming around the form of the cecum here. Here's another image using your thumbs coming into the iliac fossa to move the cecum. So we're testing it in all the different directions from medial to lateral, lateral to medial, from superior, but also superior lateral emotions. So how does it move? Is it stopped in some way? Is it then stopped from something in its surrounding um, surroundings? Motility now, that's the inherent motion. And that moves seven to eight cycles per minute. Um, it's set derived from embryological development and it's the migration that gives you this motion. But it's very, very subtle and you can feel it. And it's like an energetic feel on top of the body. You can also feel it when you're in the physical body, but it's easier to begin with to be just on the top of the body, just very softly to feel motility. For me, it took a bit of a time to feel and get familiar with that, but it gives you much more of the health of the organ, the vitality, and uh, how does that function? Um, uh, what's the health of the organ? Yeah. So the energy of it. Okay, so the motility now with expir and inspir, the two directions that we talk about. And the expir is usually towards the center. So imagine now we go towards the umbilicus, so we're coming out of the iliac fossa towards the umbilicus, the rotation towards the midline. And the inspir is away from the midline. So feel that cycle very softly in hair in motion. Differential listening now, that would be just a soft feeling on top of the cecum and feeling where on that cecum is there a problem or is it surrounding the cecum or is it behind or is there more tone? What's the depth? Is it very deep or is it heated? Is it bloated? So the feeling of it. So we have again these three different ways to evaluate locally. Now this is visual manipulation. So this is the triad that you're looking for. If it was in a knee, you're not able to do motility because it's only for the organs. Then you only have two to test and to evaluate the listening and mobility. For most osteopathic programs and physical therapy or a napropath or whatever, it is often only mobility that is tested and not with the listening. So this is the big difference from the Peral Institute to other programs. So it gives us an evaluation procedure, the general listening, perhaps a seated one. And in case of the abdomen, or the front part, it's in supine, the local listening, where you would do differential listening and inhibition, mobility and motility before you decide on which of the three would be the right way to treat. Also, would it be with more of a listening type treatment or more of a mobility type or more of motility in the way that you would work? So here is a example now of this sequel or the relationship of the cecum sequel relationship. So on your right side over here, you have the cecum laying within the peritoneum in the iliac fossa. So you have the muscle fascia as well. And underneath the muscle fascia, you have a few nerves running down. Yeah, some of the flank nerves or the um, genitofemoral, the femoral, big femoral nerve coming down, and the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. So you're into the groin, 
or into the front of the thigh, into the musculature, or on the lateral side, right? So from the cecum now, you have effects into the front, into the musculature, or into the groin, or out to the lateral side, depending on which nerve it may affect. Also, it's right there up against the psoas and the iliacus. And so many physical therapists are working on the psoas. Maybe it's the cecum. Yeah. It relates also to the small intestines and the greater momentum possibly, and the abdominal wall. So look at a close again, the abdominal musculature, and inside there, the peritoneum that we spoke about, how close that is related. So that can conflict now with the urogenital system and the digestive system, not to mention the nervous system and the musculoskeletal system. So here's the musculoskeletal test, eh? an SI joint test that, of course, will be affected because it's the iliosacral test that we're doing here. And we're on the ilium, right, with the iliacus on top of it. So, of course, that would affect the movement of the iliacus. As another example for you, I can use maybe the uh, show. Hey, okay, first show a few techniques that we would do and practice within the VM1. So there's a review of uh, some of the techniques we do there. We do the the outline and we work mobility wise, right? We show that we can do with the different directions, and we can use a long lever also, and we can use now a um, listening type or motility type treatment for the sequel. All that we will practice during the VM1 um, in class later on. So another example for you would be the liver, right? So look at all the relationships that the liver will have. You know that it's situated underneath the diaphragm underneath the ribs. We talked about it, how to feel it before. But now you didn't think about that on the right side, it also directly attaches up through the diaphragm to the pleura up through the lungs. So it could affect all the way up to the cervical thoracic spine or directly through the diaphragm, through the bare area to the pericardium and to the heart. So there is a suction between the heart and the liver. So they're very strongly attached in the center of the body. Also, we do have the relationship from the falciform coming down to the teres into the umbilicus down to the bladder, right? We have also to the kidney and to the colon. We have the the coronary ligament attaching up to the diaphragm, and then the lesser mensum going across to the stomach on the other side. So we have the stomach over here, and the lesser mensum between the two. So we can again test in the musculoskeletal system and see an effect from working with the liver to the shoulder, like I said before. And here is some of the relationships that we may talk about and think about once we're talking about the liver. So we have the relationship of the phrenic nerve because the connective tissue around the liver more directly to the right scapular area. We already talked about effect to the shoulder, but that could be both mechanical but also neurologically because of the connection all the way fascially up to the suspensory ligaments of the pleura going to the cervical thoracic junction where the innervation of the capsule of the shoulder comes out. We also have the sympathetic innervation, right? So that goes to the spine and the ribs and the mid thoracics. And we have the parasympathetic innervation 
that goes to the base of the cranium, the upper part of the neck. And there's more like a, a venous connection now also towards the left hepatic area. That is because of the hip portal vein or the acigus system. And then there is a more of a mechanical fascial route down towards the right sciatic um, area as well. So there's a lot of possibilities for the liver to have effect out through the system. All right, so ways to work with the liver. In the VM1, we talk about three different uh, motions and, and try to discern which of these three motions we try to dissect each of the um, planes to understand how we can move each of them to be able to eventually feel it three-dimensionally that we will be able to in VM2 and 3 etc. But first we take it step by step and we move here we take a, a um, transverse plane. So it's a section through the body, gives us rotation, right? So a section through the body gives us rotation. And we are rotating around the inferior vena cava. And there's a frontal plane, where now we have the left triangular ligament, right? The mid clavicular line on that left side is where the axis is, and we are doing side bending. So frontal plane, here, yeah, if you look at me, it's side bending, right? And then we have the sagittal plane also. And that is where the line goes through the body from one side to the other, from the right and to the left triangular ligament. And that would be more flexion extension. So it goes through the body and it's flexion and extension that you will work with in the liver. With that wholeness of the liver, you move it like this. So these are things that we will practice in VM1. Good. Of course, I'm also doing this to sell you the class of VM1 in November in Copenhagen. There is a class there, and you can find that on my website, uh, where it looks like this. And at the moment, you have more webinars also lined up that you can find there and, and uh, sign up for through the, after the next couple of weeks. So for me now, that ends my presentation, and I would be very happy to take a few questions if you would like to, to answer but to have some answers to, to this. So if you could, please um, write in the chat if you want to ask me a question and I can then answer it to the group. I will now unshare this part. Okay. Stop sharing. There we go. Okay. Hello there, everybody. So now I'm putting on the uh, images instead and uh, happy to see some familiar faces there, Chilin, hey. Um, and uh, I can take a question or two if you want to, to answer, ask me something. Alison. Can you give a bit more detail on the course you're teaching on Sunday? So on Sunday, it's not myself, it's a Alex Fugalo uh, from London, who's an uh, osteopath, uh, who's teaching the neuro mani manipulation uh, NM, uh, NM1 and 2 is teaching now. Uh, but that would be more introduction to that. So it's uh, more about uh, how whiplash may affect the body and how that will reflect itself within the neural uh, system. So do you use the breath in general listening and how? If you want to test twice, do you lift your hands and start over again? So, uh, 
internal listening, I discard the breath. Um, I don't think about the breath. I think about where I'm being pulled to. Sometimes in techniques, I use the breath for access, but for the technique itself, I do it independently of the breath. And, and do I, if I test twice, so if I'm with listening, general listening, I'm doing compression, decompression, as a beginner, I do it a few times to get to that level. That's what I explained before is the key for you to find where is the expression of the body. So if you are used to it, if you've done it a thousand times or 10,000 times, you just put your hand on instant that you're on the right level. But it takes time to do that. Practitioners who've been practicing for a long time uh, gets better and better at that and, uh, and it takes an enormous shortcut to find where the primary problem is, where you need to work rather than testing and testing and testing. Once I graduated as an osteopath, I had long sessions because I, as I wanted to test all these fantastic things that I've learned, mobility, uh, this and that, and I spent a lot of time testing. So most of the session of a 45 minute session, like maybe 35, uh, uh, most 40 minutes was testing. Yeah, but now it's a few minutes. So boom, 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 I'm there. So because of listening, it takes me there so quickly because I've practiced that. So I have a question, is it possible to take VM3 in Denmark if I've already taken VM2, 1, 2, and 4 in Canada? Is it also possible to take VM6 before 5? So if you're taking 1 and 2 anywhere in the world, it's possible to take VM3 in Denmark or anywhere in the world because you have that possibility to travel to, to go where you want to take a class. If you go on the uh, international site, you can go and look up a specific class and see where it's taught all over the world. So they have the full list. It's not possible to take six before five because we're building on uh, step by step the understanding and uh, when we move into the manual thermal diagnosis and the visceral emotional part, we need to have VM1 through four, five, and then six. It may not be so important between three and four, but uh, the other levels you need to do that. I will be planning a VM3 eventually, but uh, now I had to postpone VM1 that was supposed to be here in June till November and then I'll have a VM2, and then eventually a 3. So that is, it will definitely be on the program again. Uh, so probably next year. Yep. Any other questions today? No? Okay, so I will say thank you very much.